something about being black that is a gift. Like the beauty that exists in the wide range of our melanated complexions glistening in the sun. Or even the versatile hair that grows from our roots, blossoming into the most creative of styles. The rhythm of our music that flows like the Nile through our veins as our hearts and souls synchronize with every beat. And the passion we possess for whatever it is that we do that goes beyond our given talents, making us capable of mastering anything. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations, 2020 Best Podcast News Award winner and 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. And I host the only online broadcast in the world for fathers and dads that is sponsored by Dad Central and also sponsored by Dove Men Care. The only one that Dove Men Care sponsors online in the world. And I am the board chair for the Global Food and Drink Initiative, which is a multimedia not-for-profit that showcases blacks in the diaspora that are doing their thing in food, wine, and travel. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles and a solution for someone's problem. And we're broadcasting live on Black Canada Talking on August 1st, a very special August 1st, 2021, because today is Emancipation Day officially, the first time it is being celebrated right across this country. So I want to say thank you to everyone who did make this a reality, especially people like Rosemary Sadler and Dr. Wanda Thomas Bernard. Also, people like Louis Marsh, Ida Sadu, a number of individuals. We could spend the whole rest of this program just listing names of people who have contributed. But I want to say thank you so much. And it is now a national day in Canada, many years. And that has something to do with our guest today. But I just want to, before we get back to that, say Black Canada Talking is a live online event that provides Black Canadians an opportunity to give their takes and POVs on stories that are of importance to them. And also we showcase Black Canadians are doing their thing on this platform. So today, uh, no better person at this juncture in Black Canadian history to have on than Robert Small. He has revolutionized the celebration of Black History Month in Canada through his art for over a quarter of a decade, folks. Over a quarter of a decade, his art has been featured in a poster he creates called Legacy. It's distributed annually, and the poster has educated millions about the history, contributions, and accomplishments of African Canadians. He's a self-taught artist who has merged his artistic talent skills as an entrepreneur and teaching degree and teaching deg degree to demonstrate the power and art of art and conviction. He has many historical accomplishments in both 2000 to 2007 and 2021. His artwork was displayed in banks across Canada and the only African Canadian artist to accomplish this for over 10 years. His art has been featured on the side of a building in downtown Toronto, in the era of success being measured by visibility and social platforms, he maintains a vibrant presence there, as well as meet with media clips on major television outlets that have been viewed over a hundred thousand times. During his career, he has been interviewed by such major media outlets as the Toronto Star, the Toronto Sun, CBC, City TV in Toronto, and Rogers. With all these accomplishments, his artwork has even permeated the transit system in Toronto by being displayed as part of an anti-racism campaign 
which is fantastic, in over 20 subway stations on the Toronto Transit System. Along with these accomplishments, his artwork continues to be the centerpiece of Black History Month celebrations by appearing in thousands of schools across Canada. He'll be historically remembered as one of the most significant visual artists of the last two decades, forget the last two decades, ever in this country. And the future offers more accomplishments to come. What makes Robert a, a Black entrepreneur to watch in the future of merging art, education, Black history, and emerging trends? He has, he has ambitions to create a black education or, or Alexa skills, expanding the presence on the present catalog of Afrocentric activity, books for children, writing a book and creating an NFT artwork. Very nice. So you know what? The future is bright and especially today on Emancipation Day. Let us welcome Robert Small. What is up, Robert? Nothing much, man. How are you keeping? Outstanding. How about you? Yeah, pretty good, especially after you read a bio that I wrote myself, right? So that that is an outstanding bio. <laughs> no, but it's the truth. I know it's the truth. I can admit that I wrote it, but it's actually the truth. I, <laughs> nothing, nothing there is blown out of proportion, right? Well, so. no, but and I have been blessed to know Robert lot, long time. Mm -hmm. I don't even know. I don't even know where we first met, but it's been a while that we've yeah, known. Yeah, it has been a while for <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't even know when. Right? I don't even know when, but I'd say we've at least known each other minimum twenty years. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think it's been. I think it was a community type of interaction. I, mean, yes. I don't know you from universities or anything like that, right? But uh, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. Same it's been before. a minute. And uh, folks, Louis Marsh. I don't know where where I met Louis either, right? Yeah, it's and actually. Community well, self. So. Well, we have to hail out. It is Louis Marsh and Wanda uh, Senator Bernard's birthday today. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so, so both of them. So happy birthday to two uh, pillars in Black Canadian culture and Black Canadian history. So big mm -hmm. time. Thanks very much. So, Robert, many people may not know you. So for those who don't, let's get a little background about yourself, where you grew up, you know, life, school, before the world of art just sprung, springboarded <laughs> under your life. So share a little bit with your audience, with, uh, with our audience, with your, about you. Well, okay. Well, when I, I grew up here in Toronto, Ontario, right? And I grew up predominantly in Scarborough, actually, right? I was born in Fleming Park, but I never mentioned that because it makes it seem like I was there for a good portion of my life. I was there for like a hot minute when I was like in, <laughs> in, in junior kindergarten in grade one. Life was so rough back then, right? You know, so I don't I don't mention it because I don't even remember it totally, right? But the only thing I do remember about living there uh, is the fact that I was surrounded by other black kids, right? So when my parents decided to move on up and they left there and we moved to uh, we moved to North York, it was so funny because the drastic difference like came to light very quickly because like, I remember I had a few, you know, I, I got introduced to these white white kids and I think it was probably like ten, nine or 10 at the time or a little bit younger. And uh, I still had I still had Flemington Park in me. That Flemington Park, Flemington Park, were forty years ago, right? You know, so they asked me what I wanted to do for fun. So I said, "Well, okay, why don't we throw rocks at cars?" <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh boy! So they looked at me and go, oh, oh, oh. And, and I just picked. I remember this invite because it was always traumatic. Their response, right? So I picked up this rock and I threw it at a car that was passing, right? And they like looked at me like shocked, right? So I, I so I quickly needed to, found out that I need to acclimate to the white suburbs now, right? <laughs> you know. So because it, they, they their version of fun and ours was totally different, right? So absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. So no, but, uh, but, but quite frankly, I didn't have a. I had a really great great uh, childhood, even growing up, even though I was one amongst many, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, the racial issues did raise their head, you know, both, both like in my favor and not in my favor, obviously, because I was lost society and didn't have a lot of black friends around me. But the funny, uh, but it was more funny uh, things that occurred because of it, because in the, in the primary school I was in, going from grade one to six, there was like about six black kids in the whole school. Mm -hmm. And three of them were triplets, 
right? What? <laughs> yeah. What? You know, so <laughs> okay. Yeah, three of them were triplets, and they were in the grade ahead of me, right? Sure. So and Anthony, who was like the the really the strongest get kid in the school in grade six, period, bar none, right? So Anthony was the strongest kid in the in the school in grade six. And I was the only black kid in grade five, and the other two black kids were significantly younger. So when Anthony, Faye, and Andre left, half of the black school population left with them. Yes. So when I graduated to grade six, people automatically thought I was like the strongest kid in the school because I was black like Anthony. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so it, and so consequently, I got I was able to write off of that for like half of the year, you know. But then when ha- the later half of the year began, people started saying it's not really that tough and everything. So I got like kind of uh, into a few fights in the later part when the fear element started waning, right? Because people knew that Anthony could beat up everybody, but I was kind of like riding off of his coattails for. When I entered grade six and people thought I was the strongest, so, so I said, yeah, I am, I am, right? You, know, <laughs> you all back on the ranch, I was kind of faking it for a certain part of the time, well, right? So. You know, it's interesting. I can relate a bit because the public school I went to, there were only three blocks. And <laughs> yeah. one of them, one of the gentlemen left when we were in grade three. And it's funny how you meant grade six getting into fights. Actually, grade six was the last time I got in a physical fight because there was a gentleman, I I, I, re- I remember his name, Carlos Tessera. He was the bully of the school. And he called me the N-word on the day of our Christmas party. And I beat, beat, beat him down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't get in any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I just so funny and relatable. Uh, let me ask, we'll move a little bit ahead here. You, if I'm correct, you went to university in Windsor, correct? Yeah, I went to the University of Windsor, yes. You know? How, but also just touching upon the, the yeah. like capping off on that, like black males, you know, fighting and everything. Yeah. You know, it's like. I, consequently, I think that we do have to think about like male male seasoning and stuff because people say, "Oh, don't fight, don't fight, don't fight," right? But you, you almost realize the importance of not getting into a fight by being in one, right? Because you now you know firsthand that you could get really hurt mm-hmm. if you engage into into a, in a fight, and if you find that out that lesson early in life. Like, you'll stay away from it because you know that, hey, you can be beating the crap out of this guy, yeah. but all he needs is just one lucky punch and you're on the ropes. Exactly. Right? You know, and, and you know, and even though, like, I kind of played down my fighting career, but I didn't stop it. I, I think I stopped, like, when in grade eight, right? Yeah. Like, actively fighting people. Because I, I, that's what I lost, right? Like, I, I conclusively lost, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, to the point where this white guy is on top of me, and, like, I couldn't get him off him, but he had a weight advantage, right? So I always I always quelled myself with that, saying that the only reason you won is because he had a weight advantage, right? You know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I totally lost that one, and that was when my fighting career ended. Right. So, <laughs> well, something I did not know you had a fight career. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fight career. Exactly. Cool, right. Yeah. Uh, let's get talk about Windsor. Mm-hmm. Why did you chose to go to University of Windsor and how did it impact you then? And does it still impact you now, those years you spent at Windsor? Yeah, yeah. Funny I should say that because there are some people in the comments would say my fight career didn't stop. (laughs) 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 Now that you mentioned the University of Windsor, but Uh that's another story, right? All right. (laughs) You know, but um, no, and your question was if how it impacted me. Yeah, well, why did you decide to go to university in Windsor and and, and the impact it had on you then? And does it still have an impact on what you're doing today? Oh, yeah, you know, it definitely has. I think that I really didn't start becoming the person who I am now until I went to the University of Windsor, right? That kind of, when I was at the, I went to York University at first, and then I went, I transitioned to University of Windsor. I went to, I went to uh, York University for half of, half of a year. It was a condensed year. And then I transferred to the University of Windsor. And really, the only reason I went for a transfer for a condensed year 
Yeah, I'm hearing echo. I'm good on my end. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know why that's happening. But anyways, yeah, so I had a condensed year, and I went to the University of Windsor. And when I went to the University of Windsor, the reason why I went there was pretty immature because I felt like, oh, that I went down for a sports weekend. Yes. Okay, well, hold on. Some There may be many people that may not know what that is. Yeah. Or was. For, me, right? for them. Yeah, so if you can be the educator that you are. Okay. <laughs> well, sports weekend, back then, you actually played sports, and the other another university would be invited to play against each other. So, you know, uh, London, Ontario's university, you know, Western, Western, yeah, stuff like that. You know, Waterloo, they would all come down to Windsor, as well as they would have sports weekends too. And consequently, there, you know, every university would have a sports weekend uh, for uh, for the Caribbean students. Then they, there there'd be a party on sat on the Saturday, and it would be a really good time, right? Because you get introduced to other universities, and then we would go to other universities, you know. So yeah, so. Uh, I'll have to I'll have to quell myself because I'm gonna go it I'm gonna start getting into many stories, <laughs> and I'm and I won't be talking about myself. But basically, I went down there for one year when I was at the at uh, York University. My friend Dennis, who I was partying like a madman with, and it was basically my uh, brother from another mother, and still is until this very day. You know, we were having a really great time with each, uh, with each other going out and partying and this, that, and the other. So we decided to go down for sports weekend. We come back from that weekend, and I go, yeah, Dennis, man, I think I'm going to go probably go to Windsor next year, right? Because I wanted to have a real university experience. I didn't feel like I was having that at uh, York University. Stay, like, basically going to university and coming home. So he came back like a few days later and he said that he want that he thinks that he might go too right so we went down there together so i still remember that trip us taking down the 401 you know down to windsor in like uh in you know uh have a truck with all of our stuff in the back and it's clanging <laughs> and stuff like that because it's not properly <laughs> packed and you're wondering if something's going to get broken <laughs> so, yeah, so it was really it was really fun. So we, you know, so when I went when I actually got to Windsor in the four years that I that I spent there, it was a definite learning experience because, quite frankly, there are good memories, there are bad memories, right? But there are grow they're all growing memories, mm -hmm. right? You know, and uh, you know all the people that I went to University of Windsor with, we look we look back on those years fondly and stuff like that. Nice. And it was really, and we all know that going to Windsor, we, we're almost trying to duplicate a different world when we were down there, right? Okay. Like, we were watching that show, and like then we had a jammy, jammy jam. You know? <laughs> oh, and, are there any pictures of this? No, no. Oh, jeez. No. Yeah, I don't, have to, I don't think anybody, we weren't, people weren't taking pictures of, of parties all the yeah. time. Yeah, right? okay. Yeah, okay. but so between that and there was my, my DJ friend, Ron, who, t who told his, uh, his, uh, his children, when we had a party in the house, like literally the floor was going up and down, right? And I told Ron, Ron, stop, man, because the floor is like gonna break. And there was an old house that we're having this party in because we were like the Delta tribe. We were trying to bring this <laughs> Yeah, so it's another story, right? Oh. You know, so, so I went to his house a few years ago and he said, and he goes, Rob, Rob, tell my kids I wasn't lying that I was holding a party, DJing it, and the floor is going up and down, right? And I said, yeah, well, that's actually true, right? And I go, oh, I thought it was lying. I thought it was lying, <laughs> right? So, yeah, but there was, a, so there was a social element, but there was also a positive element because Detroit was right there. Yeah. So you had the history there. You had Louis Farrakhan coming mm -hmm. on the occasion. So I can remember going going to, to hear him speak. Wow. There, Public Enemy came to perform in Windsor, Ontario. I can remember Charles, Chris, Dennis, and myself 
like dressing the same and going. This <laughs> is why I wish there were pictures. <laughs> yeah, I don't want pictures of that, right? Oh, jeez. You know? <laughs> yeah, because I, I can remember Char Charles, and I'll bust out his last name, Charles Sr., right? Yes. I remember him criticizing me about what I was wearing that night, and I was wondering, why is he, why is he going off about that, right? And, you know, then I seen actually a picture of what I was wearing that night. And I go, oh, now I know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It's like, what was wow. I like wearing a sweater, right? You know? Oh, so, my God. That's yeah, good. Yeah. Good. So, well, let's go on. Because, yeah, we, we... In Windsor, you're introduced to, to black ideologies and pro-black movement. And, yes. You know, thought. And there's a lot of debate about that on our campus. And I was involved with the Black Student Association there. So it that really catapulted me into what I am today, right? So. Fantastic. I think we need to get all your posse together and host uh, our memories of Windsor afternoon or evening. Oh, I think God, that would go on the week, right? You know, <laughs> any, anybody that goes to Windsor, like, they, we all know that you can't talk to us about Windsor because we'll go, we'll talk about it all day, right? All day. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. when did art enter your journey? Uh, art entered my journey very early in life. Like I could, you know, like I'll, I'll say the reality talking about just a person, but then as a black person is another story. Like when I first entered my life, I used to read a lot of comic books when I was younger and I still do to this point, to this day. But when I started reading comic books, when I was like seven, eight, I just started trying to draw what I seen because I was very interested in how the artists like created uh, these images. So I, I just, so really I got into art, like with the, with the w w wanting to become a comic book artist, right? You know, but when you're 18 and your Caribbean parents ask you what you want to do when you, what you want to do for a career, the last <laughs> thing you say is that you want to go to New York City to, to draw Spider-Man fighting the <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to go over. <laughs> yeah, you know, so I knew that that wasn't going to go over. So even though that was in the back of my mind to say, by the time the answer came out of my life, for some reason, I said lawyer, right? So, yeah, so I originally went to the University of Windsor to become a lawyer, you know, but I graduated there with a degree in sociology and criminology. Yep. So that's how my art came into fruition as just a person. But as a black male, you know, my first experience of how race interacted with my drawings was I was actually going to draw a black character called the Falcon, right? And when I was like, I think it was like 14 or 15, and I thought that, hey, this is going to be easy because uh, the Falcon's black like me, you know, so it should be easy. So when I started drawing him, like everything, his eyes looked okay, you know, but when I started drawing his nose, like his nose came out straight. And I looked at it, I go, well, that's not how his nose looks, you know? So I tried drawing it again. It came out slightly different, but it was still straight, right? You know, and then I started wondering, like, how come, like, I can't draw what I, I know to be true type of thing, right. you know? So consequently, until this very day, you know, so I, at that time, I even became aware of that, it, it's embarrassing that as a black person, I can't draw a black nose or a black lips. Like I'm still trying to make them smaller and stuff. So even it, even now until this very day, like I tell parents that, look, you know what? If your child actually draws a picture that looks like they're trying to capture the the broadness of their nose and the width of their lips, then their self-esteem is probably on track. Right. But if you see them drawing a picture of themselves and it clearly the attri uh, attributes that they're drawing look more Caucasian than they do black, like you have to step in because that's just a sign and a half that they're imagining themselves to be something that they're not. not. Right. Right. Good mm -hmm. stuff. So you got into art. When did the legacy idea, legacy poster series, what's the history behind that? Oh, okay. Well, that, yeah, well, that's a, you know, that's another, another thing, you know, so I originally started when I, when I got out of university, like I was still hyped up on my experience at University of Windsor. 
and uh, I had to pay off my uh, student debt, right? So I said, well, why don't I sell my artwork? You know, but I was selling prints of my artwork, and they didn't necessarily, well, they weren't necessarily selling as much as I wanted them to. So I decided that, hey, why don't I, for every print that I sell, why don't I give away like something if people, someone buys like twenty dollars worth of my art or thirty dollars worth of my art? So I said, why don't I create a poster? And at that time, uh, Prince had the black album. Right? Uh, I, I just, uh, just to know, I actually have a vinyl copy of that. I have a vital copy, but you have to have a specific type. I already Googled it. I, I got the specific type. You do? Oh, okay. I have the specific type. I have the specific <laughs> type. Yes. And believe it or not, I bought it at a store. There's a yeah. store in Toronto, no longer just called Vortex Records. It oh, used okay. to be on Dundas, just, just east of Parliament. And believe it or not, I bought it for $5. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, okay. because okay, that's another story. <laughs> that's but, yeah. another story, but I'll let you back to yours. Go ahead. I'm, I'm still not letting my my version go, just in case. Right? No, I'm not letting. No, I'm not letting. No, mine, No, no, no. That's not getting away from me. No, no, no. no, no <laughs> Even no. though I know mine isn't legit, right? So <laughs> it's okay. Well, yeah, but uh, needless to say, you know. So yeah, so what I decided to de- punish out the black album. So I said, well, why don't they put out the black poster, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, nah, that doesn't sound right. The black poster, black album, you know. So I said, well, why don't I call it the, I decided to create a poster fe- feature that would feature my artwork. So I was learning what to call it. So at first I thought about calling it the black poster. And I thought, well, why don't I call it the black history poster? Then I said, then I had the bright idea of saying, well, why don't I call it the official Black History Month poster? Because that sounds proud. It sounds very assertive. It's, you know, so why don't I do that? Because there's at the time there wasn't really any poster out there, you know that and I w- that was going to be released annually. You know, so I said, well, if there's nobody else doing it, then what the heck? Why not, right? right. You know, but it was more so my like youthful enthusiasm that was cal- wanting me to call it the official Black History Month poster, not any like attempt to supervent anybody. But uh, gradually, over the, the initial years, people thought that I was trying to control Black History Month and everything like this. Yes. And, yeah, I, so you remember those days. Oh, right? yes. I remember those uh, interesting conversations. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. With, yeah. With, we, with, people, with people that will stay nameless. Yeah, we do. We have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your cue to me not to say their name? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> It, I, I, I'm just, I'm just steering the ship. You're driving the ship today. Yeah, okay. You're, <laughs> you're just, you're just making sure that you, you did, you said that you didn't want me to mention their name, right? So you got- it's totally actually, ironically, one of the people's names we mentioned before we went live. So yeah, that's well, there I- you go. I remember I didn't say it. You did. Right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> What Niels was say, like, I'll tell you, I've never been in such a foolish discussion in my life, right? You know, because if 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 I can take over Black History Month with a poster, god damn, we're in trouble. Right? <laughs> like, that's a comment on what you're doing if some 25-year-old guy or 26 can come out of the blue and make a poster and t- and take over Black History Month, right? You know, and I just used to laugh about it, but and it got to a point, right? I got, but it was serious, right? Because the, the, this person and some other people were always going on about it. Like there were times where I would go into schools, and the person barely knew me, but people would uh, that this one person would talk about my posters very adamantly, like negatively, even though the person they're talking to didn't even know me from a hole in the ground, right? You know, so I was, respect I respect both of you. I I, mm-hmm. I I was it was disappointed that that is part of the journey. Let me put it that way. Well, not well, not really. You know, because because you know what they they foolishly elevated me and made me more important than I really was at the time, right? Because they were talking about my poster not being the official. But people looked at it and said, "Hey, that's really good. God damn, maybe that is the official one." <laughs> it got it got you publicity in the eyes and and minds of people that had no idea who you were. Exactly, and and it made me and actually me calling it that 
actually made me like uh, a player in the whole thing because because one like people were talking about it making this controversy and there were, there were people actually started looking for me yes. and wondering well what you know wanting to see for themselves then they looked at this poster that looked like this and yep. said god damn maybe that is the official poster right yeah yep. because it's better because it was better than the, what the other people were making right you know and along that journey quite frankly the same person i can remember like these are stories that people don't know right and the same person even though being black align themselves with like a white feminist group and the tdsb paid the white feminist to make a black history poster and then she took all the money and gave that that person and the association they represented at the time the posters to sell on the street right and i'm looking i'm like thinking i'd have to be dead to allow someone that would allow that to happen to be the vo the the figurehead for black history in my mind right because not only did i think that, that was like almost treasonous right but it was like an insult like here you are the tsb is giving another white person a white group the money like five thousand dollars to make a poster and design it when it, when it really looked bad on top of that but they wouldn't give me five thousand dollars and they wouldn't give that the other person who's black to five thousand dollars directly but they gave them posters to sell individually right against me and i'm like going you must be insane right and then I went, and then the other instance, I went to the city of Toronto at the time. Two black people were were in charge of the recreational uh, of uh, Toronto rec, Toronto City recs and stuff, right? And they were, and they didn't weren't getting any attention to the poster that they made before that much, right? Because the only reason that they were getting attention, like during the time that I was promoting the poster, because I was calling it the official Black History Month poster. So people, when they were looking for it, or they see me on TV and they, I was calling it that, they weren't expecting that I was making it out of the basement of my house, right? You know, that the official Black History Month poster is being made some, by one individual guy. They were thinking that it was created by an association, or they were thinking that it was created by, by uh, the city of Toronto. So they would phone those places looking for the poster that they just heard on the TV. So needless to say, I can remember going to the city of Toronto. I said, well, why are you, why is the city of Toronto making a poster? And this was all 20 some odd years ago, not now, right? But why is the city of Toronto making a poster just for Black History Month and selling it? Why is the city of Toronto raising money for, to pay their bills or something? You know, like, and if they're making a, a poster just for Black History Month, why are they not making it for Asian Heritage Month, Women's History Month, no other month, but they're only making it for Black History Month, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I seen it, and these black, the black people at the time didn't have an answer for that because they knew that the only reason they were making it for Black History Month because they knew that would be something that, that's easy to do, right? So consequently, I just said, you know, the city of Toronto could be doing a, a mentoring day program for the whole for the whole month of February. The city of Toronto has so many resources, and you're like the big, biggest attribute that your biggest thing you're doing for Black History Month is the attempt to make a poster. Like, for what objective? Why? Right? So I so after that, I said, why don't you just align yourself with? Why don't you just buy the poster that I'm creating? align myself, align your, align the city of Toronto with me because it makes sense. I'm an artist, so I'm using the poster to promote my artwork. The city of Toronto is a city and you're creating a poster? Like, it doesn't make sense, right? But needless to say, they they still, they also, and going back to the elders conversation we we're having earlier, they also refuse to help me. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. funny, it's funny seeing these, uh, these uh, some of these elders now you know, because they they celebrate my poster now. But I can remember when I was young and they were like 27, 28, and I asked them for help. They totally refused, right? And, it, and, it's, and it's unfortunate. But the one thing I will say, and and people's names I will drop, are those that did support me in a, in a way, in a, in a, at a time 
where my self-esteem really needed the help. And that was uh, uh, Gene Augustine for sure. Gene Augustine asked me to come up to this uh, up to uh, Ottawa and show and show the poster that profile that she was on to the Prime Minister of Canada. You know, and that was like a big self-esteem boost because I because at the time I just said, well, hell, if Gene Augustine is validating what I do, what, why should I give a rat's ass what these other people think, right? Like, who are they compared to her, right? You know, and then you know, uh, you know, there, then Hamlin Grange at the yeah. time when I he actually gave me enough inspiration, really, to I never told him this, but to to leave my job and just go straight on into my artwork. I can wow, remember wow. one time he had a conversation with me because I was I was working at the YMCA at uh, the Black Achievers at the YMCA, and he was my supervisor at the time, and I was the director of the YMCA Black Achievers program. But you know, so it's a program where you mentor, where you, where we pard like black professionals with black youth. So consequently, I was the director of the program, and when people would talk would talk to me about it. Like they expected me to really feel good about being the director because I was director of a black program at like 31, right? But I, but behind the scenes, I kind of felt, well, it's not really my program. Like I don't own it, right? Like I'm just the black face to it, really, right? Like the YMCA was doing great, great things with great things with it before me, and when I was doing, and I was able to do some great things during that time. You know, but when I left, like the only title that I'm going to have after I leave here is my name. And I got more pride. Pri I was more proud about people calling me the creator of the official Black History Month poster than I did the other thing. You know, and one time when I went to lunch with Hamlin Grange, he we were talking about all that and specifically the poster. And he said he told me something that I repeat to people nowadays. And he asked me, like, okay, so what's your end game? Like, how? what's your escape plan? So at the time, I was kind of, like, you know, sensitive about my poster because some people were telling me it looks like crap, right? So I didn't know what how to take what he was saying. And I, so I just go, what do you mean? And he goes, well, the problem is in our community, Robert, is that some people wrap their identity around what they do. And when it's time to leave or when it's time to pass it on, they can't do it because their identity is wrapped around yeah, that yeah. one thing, that association or that one thing that they create. But you have to you have to position what you're doing for as something that can be sold to somebody else because you might want to get out of it, you know. And I and I went I can remember riding the subway home and thinking about what he said, right? And consequently, those words stick to me to this very day. Because I don't, even though I enjoy doing the poster, it's really, really is me, you know, but the poster itself is a product, right? You know, so, and consequently, that's why I always think about it as something to be handed down, right? Nice. nice. Very, very, very nice. So, so, so let's, so let's uh, getting a little bit of echo here. Okay, I think it's gone now. So let's, let's talk about some of the great moments you've had along the legacy poster journey, some of the highlights. I, I did mention some of them in our, in the intro, but what are some other things and what, what are some proud moments you've had with this poster? You did mention when Gene Augustine invited you up to Ottawa. And also I've got to hail up Gene Augustine also on a Manson patient day. One of the key people, key people that's made this day a reality in Canada, but what are some of the key moments along the journey that you can remember and are not wanting to, for, will never forget. Sorry. It, it kept, you know, one that was one because my my older daughter, she was like one years old at the time. She was, and she actually came up to Ottawa uh, with me at the time. So it's 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 really powerful for me to see like uh, you know pictures of her and G, and John Kretsch like holding her and stuff like that. You know, so that was memorable. The other things that were memorable in my during this poster was when Master T was was having electric circuits and everything like that and he was nice enough during black history month to showcase some of my artwork and that was something that was really happened when uh it was really formative years of my of creating my art and doing my poster then with opsu who's been a sponsor of my poster for several years they put 
they've been putting my artwork on the side of a building of their building at Young and, Young and Wellesley for the last whoa last ten years they've been doing that right so yeah so so even now you know there's a piece of my artwork on the on the side of their building now at Young and Wellesley if you were to walk north the, uh, east from the corner of Young and Young and Wellesley you'd see their uh, that that picture on the side of the wall. And uh, the bank of, and the Bank of Montreal. Even last year, the Bank of Montreal distributed my uh, poster, a miniaturized version of my poster, uh, to ever to all the branches across Canada. And in 2007, they distributed my actual poster in all their branches across Canada too. So there have been a lot of uh, powerful moments that I'll never forget. Oh, well, congratulations to you on that. And uh, for people who don't know, OPS is the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. And uh, earlier on, Robert mentioned TDSB is the Toronto District School Board. Some of the acronyms, because I we have a worldwide audience, so I just want to make sure they're not left. What are these acronyms? What are these things going on here? Yeah, yeah. And a that, convers that, that answers with the Toronto School Board. You know, they did that. That happened set, like 20 years ago. Yes. Right? But for yes. the last, but for longest time and even now, like the Toronto School Board have been powerful allies of mine, right? Wonderful, wonderful. But, well, but there was one guy there that kept on blocking me that, that <laughs> You know who you are. <laughs> How you like me now? Uh, <laughs> you, well, you know what? Sometimes success is the best revenge. Well, it, it is, you because you don't have to do anything, right? And people know that you're talking about them, but you're not dropping them type of thing. Right. Right. This and is good. Sad. You know, and, and meanwhile, I'm doing it playfully, but it's sad, really. Right. You know, and it's a lesson because, uh, you know, going back to it all, like and elders and everything, you know, I remember, like I mentioned, Jean Augustine, Hamlin Grange, but there also, I also have to give it up to Linrod Douglas, who yes. was the CEO of Black Pages at the time. Right. Yep. And once again, he entered my, my life in a formative year, in a really formative time, too, because. I started working for Black Pages when I was like 26, and Black Pages is a directory that lists all the black black businesses at the time. And uh, wow, it was like 1995. And remember, we were have and Black Pages were having, and I haven't seen this yet. Match, but Black Pages had a Black Business Week when they had from Monday to Sunday, they had events for the black community from nine o'clock in the morning till five or seven o'clock at night every day, mm -hmm. right? And this was like 25 years ago, right? You know? And uh, I was working for them straight out of the university, writing, writing off of Louis Farrakhan in my mind, right? <laughs> so I can remember one time Lindrod and uh, Millicent Redway, they, uh, you know, so Jesse Jackson came down to Toronto, right? Yeah. I was there bringing them down, and we were living high off the hog at that point, <laughs> right? Like, we really thought that things were going great, right? So I can remember them asking me when I was 26, 27, if I wanted wine. I go, wine, Millicent, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, right? You know, but yeah, but it was it was fun times, you know? But, but at that time, like, I didn't know some of the skills that would catapult me into who I am now. And those were introduced to me by uh, Linrod Douglas, who at the time, you know, I was advertising in Black Pages, my artwork. And one day he asked me, well, Robert, do you know how to do to to work in like Photoshop? And I go, no, I haven't even touched like a computer. Like I have a computer at home, but no, I don't know any graphics programs. And he goes, no, it's pretty simple. And he showed me and he asked me to come down to the Black Pages uh office that was downtown Toronto and uh, showed it to me. And so I said, yeah, I could do something like this pretty easy. Right. So then he asked, so then I became employed as the uh, graphic designer of black pages. So I created, you know, one of the black pages uh, for that year. I actually have it on my bookshelf. Right. Nice. But, uh, yeah. You know, so, so then they pretty much all showed me and Linrod really did like help me develop into the person I am now. Put me on the path to being the person I am now because I kind of said, "Well, goddamn! Like this brother just like literally, you know, goes to work by coming from going upstairs to downstairs, mm -hmm. right? 
you know, mm -hmm. because they were operating out of their house, right? And I said, yeah, that's the type of job I want in my life, <laughs> want, right? You know, so in the original days, I was thinking about how to become a cheap version of Linrod Douglas, right? So there you yeah, go. You know, but eventually the key is not being a version of somebody else, but a first rate version of yourself, right? You know, but him and various other uh, black men and women really helped develop me into who I eventually become, right? So nice. Well, for those who don't know, you can tell Rob and I go way back, and it's very rare that him and I don't have a conversation where social political commentary comes up. So we have to get into a little bit, and uh, we're going to have some good conversation on some topics that Robert wanted to chat about. And of course, we are coming out of a pandemic and it is Emancipation Day. So, Robert, what does, in your mind and your heart, what does free look like in the present era after a pandemic? What does free look like for Black Canadians, in your opinion, on Emancipation Day 2021? Well, I think I think what, what it looks like is a lot different than it has in the past. I think that in the past, we had the luxury of just thinking about Emancipation Day in respect to the past and thinking about how how like hard it was for people who were enslaved physically to uh, get through that and celebrating our freedom that we're not like that, like that in the past. But now, after the pandemic, I don't think we have the luxury of sitting around just thinking about the past. We have to think about uh, really hard about how we're presently enslaved in the present. Right. And partially being partially enslaved to the present means that we're not trying to actually do what it is that we're really supposed to do. And certain things are doing for our community unapologetically. And consequently, you know, with the pandemic, it brought forward a lot of issues that were pertinent to the black community and that the black community has to take an active role in solving. I think prior to the pandemic, we were bludgeoned to death with award shows and, you know, and, enter and entertainment masks as social activism and stuff like that, thinking that we're have and, you know, but now with the pandemic sh showing really hard problems in the black community that the pandemic just amplified, you know, whether it be food insecurity, whether it be uh, health issues that, that our community specifically face, now you've seen a rollout of money from the federal, provincial, and well, mostly federal government, right? That's and programs on the municipal level that's directly aimed at the black community. And they're no longer looking for like a white savior to be a part of it. They're actually telling like black organizations and black individuals to be parts of these programs because you we need you specifically to tell us what is the problem and how to solve it well you know and, and so we don't have the luxury of sitting on the sidelines anymore we do you feel i mean put it this way what do you think is holding us back especially after a pandemic what is holding us back well, you know what? I don't think that I think the one thing that's holding us back as the collective is the fact that we haven't had the 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 practice of working together. Like that's a skill that you develop. It's not something that's just assumed, right? You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like when you know when some when some females, I mean, some females, right? You know, complain about a guy not holding it, not knowing what to do in the house, right? But I go that, look, if you married a guy that, li that lived in an apartment all his life and you lived in the house, like he might not know the dynamics of mowing the lawn because he hasn't lived in the house where he had to mow the lawn, you know? So he had to, so if you've ever lived in the house, you know that you have to mow the lawn like every second week at the very most during the summer, right? You know, because if you don't, it'll grow incredibly. That'll be out of control. So then you'd really have to spend more time. But if the guy lives in the house, how's he going to know that? He will. He'll, you are, you're assuming that he knows how to work a, a lawnmower. But he, why would he know how to, to operate a lawnmower? He's never had to before. Mm -hmm. You know, so consequently, you know, the same thing holds true 
so you're having these expectations of him that he's just, it's not like he doesn't want to, but he's just not unaware how. And with respect to the black community, it's something similar that we that we know that we should be able to work together. But working with black people is a skill, right? The same way that if you're working, if you're working with handicapped people, if you're working with deaf people, if you're working with like aboriginals, if you're working with women, like you don't throw like a like someone working with women that has a mindset that's anti-women. You just don't, right? You don't so throw someone together with people who who have uh, learning disabilities when they say inappropriate language about right. them, right? So consequently, you don't throw just any black person to work with black people, <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so let and me it, go. Let's look, we're gonna simple, go deeper. That sounds simple when I say that, you know, but, but it's. I'm, but it's just it's rampant that there are just some black people that are that are ill equipped to work with other black people. They don't have any experience and they wouldn't if if working with black people was a natural job that they had to be interviewed for, they would never get the job. Right? Because they just don't have the experience working with black people and they don't have the experience of proof that their work with black people has actually borne fruit, right? So if you ask if you ask any of the pro, the presidents of these black organizations what what uh, history they have working with black people and how how can they how can they say that they're successful working with black people they wouldn't be able to answer you. So then why does why is it a lot like w w would you say we're our own worst enemies? Well, yeah, well we are because but and to and to compliment those people. The people that do become president of these associations, they often step into voids that other that people that know better, like us as well, you know, and, and me included, don't step into when we know. That I, I think you bring up a very interesting point. There are so many people I know that are talented, yeah. truly talented. And when I tell them about why don't you get involved, no way, man. That's like I'm, that's like going into a minefield. And, yeah. and it's unfortunate that there is a large amount of people that could really make a positive difference to a yeah. lot of these organizations won't go there because the organizations aren't, let's just say, efficient. <laughs> yeah. So that's code for blank, blank, blank. <laughs> <laughs> right. <It> just <laughs> eff eff Efficient, right? <laughs> like there's so yeah. many, like, and, and it's, I, I talk to so many people say, you know what? I did my time in these organizations. It was a mess. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, they they and signed I, out. They've checked out. Yeah, and when I and when I say these things, I'm not taking myself out of it either, right? You know, and I was oh them them them, but you know, it also includes me. Like if someone asked me to be president of a black organization, I'd say, well, no, I you know, like I have so much going on, like individually, that I wouldn't be able to take on that, right? But that even though that might be an excuse to some. But in reality, I also like I because I'm in control of what I do, I'm not disappointed. Right. So, I, yes, I couldn't become a president of an association and stuff like that. But you, that, then the people but you have to report back to a board that might not necessarily agree with your politics or your approach. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that I want, the reason that I wouldn't become involved, because I'm not going to. I've been working in the black community for over for basically 30 years. Okay. Like directly with the black community. Yep. And yep. I can I can list off the results of what I've accomplished in the black community. So it's not like me just beating my chest or feeling good about it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like I distribute a, po a poster that I create with my own money yep. <clears throat> and distribute it across the province. But these guys, some guys, some of these may get millions of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars and you don't know who the hell they are, right? Mm. So I just have to laugh about it because you the reason you don't know who they are after all this time is because they just don't know how to get out to the black community, right? And that's the real reason why you don't know about their services because if they, if they knew with the money that they're getting, they'd be able to do something. They'd be able to create something, right? What do you feel, since we're going there, what do you feel about the whole funding ecosystem? Well, we, we can't, we can't, uh, you know what, like, 
with the funding aspect, right? Like I think I I can't. I noticed, I noticed at one point when I was doing the post, I was my third year doing the post, I was 28 and uh, Loblaws dared to sponsor my poster at that time. Right. Yep. Prior to that, I only had black organizations sponsoring my poster. Mm-hmm. Loblaws gave me the money. They didn't care. Right. You know, but the response from people in the community was, uh, oh, you're big time now. Hey, eh? Loblaws. Sponsor- <laughs> Lava sponsored you and everything, right? Yeah. And I'm like going, and I knew that spot that Lava's gave me the money. They didn't even think about it. It was no big deal to them at all. But amongst the community, it was seen as like some big stepping on up type of moment, right? And if that had gone to my head, like I would have been going after sponsors from top to bottom, right? But and I think that when you get sponsorship money from different corporations and everything. You, it does create the element that you're responsible to them, right? You know, whether they say it or not. Like, even though at that time, even though I got sponsorship from Loblaws and they didn't really tell me who I should put on, who shouldn't, do everything like that, I still felt like a certain responsibility to the fact that they sponsored me, yeah. right? It didn't make me th- do it differently, but I did kind of like, m- like be careful about what I said. Right. But you also have the response. But at the time, I also felt a responsibility to the black community to keep to keep uh, my poster going. Right. So I so I wouldn't just flip off my mouth and jeopardize that either. Right. right? But I think with the funding models that are out today, like I kind of question whether they're pursuing the actual goal or the money. The money is the goal. Right. Because oftentimes they'll go if, if you're pursuing a goal, you know, in my mind, if you're getting money to create like a center or anything like that or a program, for for example, like you'll mention, OK, well, these are the details of what the program's going to do. And we need this amount to make it happen. And when the black community asks you, well, what, hey, brother, what are you going to do with that money? You can say details well on Monday, these programs are going to be running on Tuesday. These programs are going to be running on Wednesday. These programs are going to be running Thursday. We're going to rent it out Friday. We're going to rent out Saturday. We're going to rent it out between six and seven o'clock. So shut up and don't tell, ask me about what I'm going to do with the money. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, go, go screw yourself. Right? Because you already have a prepared answer for what's going to happen on every day, you know, and, you, both you and I know I've done programming. I could I could make up if someone were to give me one to give me two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I could make up programming for the whole week right now within yep. like within twenty within two hours. I could do easily, it. easily, 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 right? So you really so with these organizations that you ask them that question and they still don't have a clear answer for you. I'm sorry, they don't know what they're doing. Because well, some, some of them, you, they, some of them are around for a for one or two years, and you ask them what the, what they're going to do with the money, and they can't they can't detail it out for you. And the only reason they can't de- detail, oh, they said, oh, we're going to go into the black community, ask questions, do a survey, find out. You only do that if you don't know what you're going to do, what the hell you're going to do, right? Because you don't have any experience working in the black community to to know that hey the black community needs entrepreneurship programs uh we need for entrepreneurship programs for black fathers who are financially having financial issues for black mothers who are single so we should probably have two different seminars for them for different reasons right yeah. then there's international students and transition black international students from the caribbean predominantly from jamaica then there's the students who are born here and students who, that were born here and they need specific specific types yep. of programs. Yep. Like, like in five minutes, I just told you like program that can happen for one day in five minutes, right? Mm-hmm. You know, just based on entrepreneurship. Yeah. You know, and those are and anybody that's done programming in the black community would, would always say that what I just said is valid. 
right? Absolutely. So why would I have to do a fact finding mission based on that, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I if I told you I was getting funding for a hundred thousand dollars to do what I just said in five minutes, would you question me on anything I just said? No need to. There would be no need, but there would there would be a need if. I said to you, well, we're going to be doing a survey. And after the survey's done, you know, we're going to do a fact finding mission. We're going to make a report. After the report's done, then we're going to create the programming based on the report. And that's said constantly. And to, to someone who's worked in the black community before, ah, these people just don't really know what they're doing. Well, the, the, the disturbing thing about that for me is we're researched out. <laughs> right i like and the sad thing is in the time that those research and hey people got to do their research but in the time that you're doing research people are suffering like we're dealing with day-to-day -day issues when you're doing surveys i think look if people want to know the challenges in the black community either you can go to people like robert or myself and there's other people out there or come on down give us about three or four hours we can show you <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and and just listen, <laughs> and if if they were just and the but the thing about it is they don't know who the players in the black community are, right? You know, I always say that there's a difference between like having the 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 social experience of being black and working in the black community, yeah. right? Yes, you are black, <laughs> right, yeah. and you've been black all your life. But that doesn't make you qualified to work in the black community because you'll get frustrated very easily, right? And then you're you think that you're some grand poop, you're king of the blacks coming in. King of the blacks. <laughs> That's wow. hilarious. I've heard that one before. Go on. <laughs> king of the blacks. Okay. I, I, yeah, I made that up a few years ago. I throw it out there sometimes for laughs. Right? King of the blacks. Okay. <laughs> All right. And that you're coming in, and that all of a sudden, just because you're on the scene, that pe because you're some big, some big wig in the black, in the white community, and the white community knows you, you think that coming in as the black savior now, because now you're you're on the case, that things are going to change, right? And lo and behold, two years ago by or five years go by, and nothing's changed, and you thought, and you made all these grandiose promises to the black community. And they don't come into fruition, and you're wondering why. It's like, well, one, you've come from like the Royal Bank, or the, I should have name dropped corporation just in case I have to go them for funding. <laughs> yeah, you be careful. <laughs> you be careful well, who you talk the, about. Okay, it's the Royal Bank. Right? Okay, RBC, <laughs> edit, gone. Yeah, yeah, you can edit that out. You can edit that out, right? You know, but uh, jokingly. But no, you're coming from a white organization and you might have like a title there, but you don't have a title in the black community that you've earned, right? You know, and consequently, they made the mistake of thinking that because they have a, uh, they're the director or CEO in a white organization, that, that is a transferable skill to the black community. And the black community should just bow and like listen to everything you say. And that doesn't, and it doesn't happen. It's never happened. And over the 20 years that I've known you, there have always been like important black people coming forward to say that they're on the case, that they're going to do this, that, and the other. And where are they now? And, and, and the thing, and people can test out what I just said. The, the, when you, whenever you hear about a black person saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. The first question you should ask them, how long have you been working in the black community, in a black or all, all black organization, and what have you accomplished? Because show me, show me the receipts. Exactly. And that's not an off question to ask. If I was going, if I was going to Royal Bank and I wanted to become the branch manager, what's the first question they're gonna ask? What experience do I have? Yeah. They're gonna ask me, what experience do I have? What history do I have at the branch? And can I see your references? So consequently, any black black person that talks to you about they want to do they want to create a credit union, they want to do this, they want to create a center, you know, like okay, if you're going to create a center, what experience do you have in managing a facility that's a million that's worth a million dollars? What history do you have doing that? Have you hired have you hired so have you hired ground people before? 
have you have you put a money aside for the maintenance of that of that facility? Mm-hmm. Have you have you projected what how much revenue you're going to be having for five years in the future? These are questions that a white guy would ask you if you're going for a job, right? So consequently, I shouldn't be seen as hurting your feelings <laughs> if I ask you. <laughs> If I ask you those questions, come on, Ed. Hey, look, look. Am can, I lying? Am I, am I no, lying? but I'm just, saying, I'm just saying, you have no experience with this, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I can remember specifically, this, you know, me asking this question of this one guy that had this, these uh, wanting to do something. I won't say what it is because it will give it away, right? And, and he's a nice guy. I don't want to throw him on open street, right? But uh, I asked him, you know, what experience do you have, like, doing such a, a venture? And he says, well, I've worked for one or two, I've worked for, like, two years at this, at a similar, in a similar vein, right? Yeah. I go, yeah, but two years is one above one. <laughs> and, the, and the first year working anywhere, who would ever say that their experience, like, after working someplace for one year? Right? So I'm asking this in a group of people, and he's like, oh, Rabbi, you're hurting his feelings. Like, oh my God. You know, like, it's better me hurt his feelings here than he, he be responsible for like hundreds of, hundreds of black people's future. Mm-hmm. And he disappoint hundreds of black people, right? By making this, these grandiose plans and everything. So I, I would say, quite frankly, that uh, there are organizations, and I would mention the BPA, that have finally come into who they were supposed to be now, really, and doing a lot of programs that are centered towards the black community, centered towards black businesses, and they're just like rolling them out. And I never, and prior to them rolling them out, I didn't hear the president say that we're going to do this, we're going to do that. They, she just did it, right? You know, so I would have to, I'd have to give it up to the president of black business professionals, uh, Nadine Spence, who is is uh, spearheading that now, as well as the board, right? So. Yeah, Nadine Spencer, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, you somewhat covered this, but I, I just want to know if there's anything else you want to fill in. So do you feel the explosion of Black groups and funding positive or negative so far, especially in the last two years? Well, you know what? I think I... You know what? I think it's... I think it's it's uh, how do I to say be it? determined. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know what? It, it is to be determined, right? You know, because it's good. Because it, I was going to say that it's gotten black people involved, but then on the negative side of it, there, are, as you know, there are some black people that think that here, like Pierre Trudeau, uh, Trudeau Justin. Justin Trudeau, I always make that mistake, you know, Justin Trudeau, you know, announcing money for black businesses. And the the black business that does black guy that does work at Royal Bank, I'm always using Royal Bank as an example, right? Like he thinks that he's he's not getting in on that money somehow. I'm going no, like it's for black businesses. Like he's giving out money to black organizations, but I think that the black average black person on the street doesn't doesn't know or doesn't even care to know that there are black organizations that the individuals that work there wake up every day working on behalf of just black people. Mm-hmm. I think that there are some people that don't even know that, that there's, you know, once again, once again that there's centers for black men to, to come to in order to learn being better fathers, that there's organizations that focus on just immigrant, immigrant blacks from, from Africa and this, that, yeah. and the other. Like they're just totally aware, unaware. So when they hear like Trudeau mentioning that, they think that oh, you know, wasn't there some black signal that was supposed to go up like the bat signal, and we're <laughs> supposed to be told about it? I go no, like you're supposed to. The only, the reason that the way that you'll know about these black organizations is becoming involved with them, right? And don't think that there that there's some clique or nothing like that because that's not the case. As you would know, Ed, like these black organizations would welcome a hundred black people to join them tomorrow mm-hmm. even a volunteer or just to be aware of them period. Right. But you know, with, with, uh, with us, we have to get involved. And that's, and that's something that I think that the pandemic, unfortunately, uh, you know, 
basically became a cattle prod that stuck us in the back to get us moving to become involved in our community. So that in that respect, it's uh, it's positive. But in the, the the other respect, you know, I think that people are, uh, are some. There are some people that have been motivated by the money. I I was just just gonna get to that because yeah. and, and some people seeing it as some last 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 attempt as a as a retirement plan, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, one of the challenges I feel that a no- Okay, I'll put it out there. I think a number of blacks are challenged by one of these three things or a combination of these three things. Okay. Trauma, repetition, or symbolism. So what you just said about with these announcements of money coming, money coming, Mm -hmm. symbolism, has the money actually got to anybody really? Not not really, no. Right? So... Many of us love great symbolism, but when, like you just said a few moments ago, I've got this organ, these organizations, this and that. But when you really dig down after the symbolism of the uh, announcement, or I, I'm doing this organization, what are the receipts? <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly it. Because because <laughs> the the big the funny thing, and I'm I'm just using this as an example. It's not meant to condemn or 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 or. Uh, Condemn or like validate what yeah. they're doing. Well, with the Black Lives Matter center that they just recently purchased for eight hundred eight million dollars, right? You know, a lot of people would would say the so city of Toronto says, "Oh, we're giving two hundred fifty thousand dollars towards the center," right? But no, I was told that they're giving two hundred fifty thousand towards programming. That's meant just towards programming. So, in other words, that means that the center has to be operational and working and off the ground in order for them to get that 250 that money. Yes. Well, they haven't got one red cent from this. They've gotten a promise, like so many other people have gotten promises. But if I if I was evil whitey, right, I would make promises too. When I when I when when I know when I'm sitting there going, oh you have the center? Oh, how much is it going to you, you have to hire two, let's say two janitors at the very minimal for a place like that. So how much is a janitor going to get? 50000 a year? 50000 a year, two? That's $100,000 for just two people? Right there. Right, right there. Right there, that's $100,000. Then there's a groundskeeper. <laughs> I'll, I have an eight million. <laughs> like, how much are you going to spend on that? Then the show snow, shoveling the snow. That has to happen, period, right? You can't just let it pile up. When you when you have a center, you have to plow that because you're gonna get your ass sued off if someone slips there. It's a, it's a, so have, well, and on top of it, insurance for the <laughs> for eight million dollar facility downtown, <laughs> right? You know, and consequently, what? I, hey, I love you know, like all power to them and everything, right? You know, but once again, you know, to me. I'm sitting there going like right off the bat, just those three things that we mentioned. That's 150 grand right there, a year, and mm-hmm. that's just to maintain the place. And you need a building manager, someone to coordinate all the events that are going to take place for every day throughout the whole year. So right there, that's 200 grand easy, mm-hmm. and you haven't even gotten to the programs and and that and the other. So while while it's you know while we celebrate you know these things we have to really think about the dollars and cents of it all right because the problem that i have with these announcements and the symbolism of it all is there's the symbolism of the victory but there's also the symbolism of the defeat of it if it happens right because then people start saying oh you know yeah black people we can get together and all this other stuff, but no, there are black people that are together, but it's, but oftentimes when these things occur and they don't work out, not saying that this is way this won't work out, but sometimes it's the people that are involved that are the problem because they're ill-equipped to actually do what they're saying they want to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And then we get behind them because of the symbolism, 
but we don't ask the hard questions that, okay, have you, have you been, you know, in charge of building management? Have you been the executive director of a place of a black organization before? Have you worked at a black organization before? And what, and once again, where are the receipts of that? Mm -hmm. Right. Have you mobilized black people on a large scale other than the people that you know? Right. It's one thing for me to mobilize you, you know, Hamlin, <laughs> yeah. you know, a different book list and people that I know. But have I had a, a wider range between purple that just black people that just like me, right? Yeah. You know, can I mo do I have I mobilized just the average black person on the street? Yeah. Right? You know, and that's very, very questionable, right? Mm -hmm. And once again, like the, you know, like I feel like it's almost my duty to throw out these questions through your podcast. And I think it's very valid, very important. There's something, there seems to be a resistance, and you've mentioned it already, of asking the hard questions. I don't know where it's from. I, I don't know. It, because I there may be certain individuals that it would rock their boat if the hard questions were asked and attempted to be answered. Would you disagree? Yeah. You know, it, it, it would because – the person asking knows that the person can answer that question <laughs> and, the person, and the person that's receiving it doesn't knows that they can't answer the question. And that should be, and if anything, asking the question, these direct questions, it's actually saving them because if the questions I just asked you about, if you've been ever been a building manager before, have you ever been in charge of, of staff beyond two people like yeah. god damn like what is that a is that a hard question to ask look look if let's let's flip the script say this was for a for-profit venture you better believe those questions yeah be and, asked. And, but and and there should be no difference yeah there and, should be no difference whether it's for profit or not for profit no and and you know what here we go here's the real <laughs> real thing if I was your white boss asking you that question, would you think, would you not answer me? Mm. Would you get mad if I was your white boss and I asked you those questions to get, for you to get a job? Mm. You'd answer them. And you'd and answer it and you'd like it. So if I ask you that question, then, and you feel resentment towards me because you're seeing a black face similar to mine, you're not worthy to do that. Anything on behalf of black people. And just the fact that you don't want to answer it just because you feel, oh, Robert, you, you know, like that's too hard of a question and stuff like that. Like, I don't feel like answering that. Oh, you know, like, yeah, we'll work that out in the future. Like just by the fact that you are not willing to answer that and you can't answer it, you're unworthy to do your project. Because someone asked me if I, to draw a painting of them, I say, yeah, I'll call, of course. When you want it, two weeks from now, a week from now, and it says, oh yeah, Robert, what's your proof that I that I've done it? Oh yeah, just right behind me, right there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's my proof. Hey, if you don't like that, then I'm not your guy. But if you like oh, it, then I'm your guy. Where has this mindset come from? I, I th the the hard truth once again is like. <laughs> The sad part about it is I think that we're just a lot of us are just insecure. And 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 once again, we we haven't had that history of there's not never been really a hard history of black people doing things on behalf of black people and living up to what they promise. Mm. And there's never been repercussions if they haven't lived up to what they promise. I can remember a guy coming to First Friday saying that, oh, we're going to make a center for black people. And there's going to be like, <laughs> there's going to be a center for black people. There's, we're going to have one place we're going to be having the music center. We're going to have like Aretha Franklin, all these other people come and perform. Then we're going to have the art center right beside it. And I'm looking at his drawing and I'm going, the architectural drawing yeah. that he presented, I go, what the heck is that? Right? <laughs> like, like, it looks like an episode of Star Trek. Like, like, <laughs> it, like, it, like clearly, 
clear, I'm an untrained eye, right? Yeah. Well, clearly he grabbed that picture off the internet, right? <laughs> That's and wrong. That's yeah, wrong. Yeah, That's so yeah. Wrong. And I'm and and since I'm a graphic designer, like he, exactly like, <laughs> you, yeah, his logo on one of the buildings, right? And I'm sitting there in the crowd. I'm going, oh, Robert, just shut up. Don't say nothing. Just shut up. Don't say nothing, right? And he kept on, and like I was just burning inside of me. And I go, look, guy, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> So how much money have you raised? Like, what have you done before, right? And once again, you know, oh, don't hurt his feelings, right? But meanwhile, that guy's nowhere to be found now, right? And the idea didn't get off the ground at all, right? And I wonder you know? why. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, he, and it was exposed that he didn't have really the skills to galvanize the black community because he had no experience doing so, right? So oftentimes, like... I told someone that was that uh, sometimes you don't have to try, you know, running after some black organization and questioning them about it because they don't understand that they're exposing that there's certain faults that they have that will come into fruition. They're not the first yo like young black person on the mm -hmm. scene that the community believes in so highly to accomplish great things only to only to fall prey to being on TV and everything like this. And the, they get all this attention and consequently they fizzle out because they, their interest is just being on TV. Well, they have nothing. Symbolism again. I get yeah. back to the symbolism thing all over again. Yeah. They have the symbolism, but they don't have something factual that they're offering the pro offering the black community. You know, so they'll talk about police violence or talk or just be talking all the time, but they don't have anything that they're offering the black community, right? You know, so at this point, at this point, at this point, really, after the pandemic, our resistance has to take the form of actual progress and something physical that you can hold on to, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, we can, no longer can we just hope for promises. Right. Yeah. So, exactly. So the good thing, what the positive thing about the one of the positive things about the symbolism related to the Black Lives Matter the center is the fact that it can occur. Right. You know. But and and the and there's the long hill of of making sure that this comes that this lasts for 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. So consequently, that's really important that the people that are involved with some a venture like that realize that they have to that if you start it you should be committed to it for the next five or six years really if you really want to get off the ground right you know and i and i don't think and sometimes i don't think that people are thinking they have to be involved for that long period of time but the only reason that you do is because history has shown that when black people get involved with some so something the only the only the only times that it's really gotten off the ground when certain people stick together, stick there for a long period of time. Right. Tropicana, people have stuck, the, the executive director, the accountant, and and about three or four of the staff were there for more than 20 years. Right. The BPA, in in many years, the, the current president has been there for like four years. The president before that was there for like eight years. <laughs> the other the other president before that was like four or six. Right. You know, so constant. And so the JCA, you go there now and some of the people and so the C in the seniors, they've been there for like 20 years and stuff like that. Yeah. It, some of the people on the board have been there for umpteen years. So yeah. where so where do you see examples of in our community where people have just been there for two, two years and that organization or that entity has has kept on going? The only the only uh, example that I can know of is I think it was a Canadian Urban Professionals, the black, the black. Uh, there's a there's a black coalition of urban professionals here in Toronto, and they pretty much will have had had the the greatest structure that I've seen in a black organization, because the president I don't know if it's changed, but the president could only serve for two years. Yeah. And then, 
then the vice president immediately becomes a president. There ain't no vote. There ain't no coup that can happen. Right? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right? Oh, no. Don't start you know, with coups. Go on, yeah, please. So next, no please. Coup that can happen. If you're the vice president, you're becoming president, period. Right? Mm-hmm. And then it just continues like that. Right. So and the beauty of that, that model that they have is that the vice president has to prove that they're presidential. Right. By the time they become they have two years to prove that they're presidential nice. before they become president. And the next and the person that wants to become president has to wait to become president. Mm-hmm. So they have to. So if they are the treasurer, they have to prove that they can become president. by, by within four years at the very least. Right. Wow. So it so it prevents these type of like impulse. Oh, I, oh, no one's here that wants to be president. I'll become president. I'm black. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which so, never happens. You know, those things never oh, happen. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> I could name three times it's happened in the last year and a half. Right. You know? Yeah. But, you know, but with the, the urban professionals, I would give it to them. I haven't been involved with them for several years, but. You know, that's not the urban that. financial professionals or urban professionals. They, I always forget their the, the, the because is name. that the Canadian Association of Urban F- Professional yeah, Farmers? Yeah. That yes, and it's is it Merrill Africa who's I the head of that? Or- yes, that that organization's run tight, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and once again, going back to what I said, my critical elements is that they don't talk about what they're doing. They just do it. Right? <laughs> exactly. They don't have no press conference. They don't have no announcement. They just do it, right? <laughs> you know, and so then I give, I give it to up to them this very day, right? You know, and that's something that we should all do, that we should all do. Well, folks, as you see, Robert and I could go on for hours and hours, but we're not going to keep you on for hours and hours. But I know, I know. so... um. As we wind it down, my man, what are you looking, what are you excited about going forward? What's the future looking like for yourself, legacy, et cetera? Well, the future is really looking good. You know, the bottom line is that uh, this year, this week even, I have my I have a piece of my artwork on the cover of Caribbean Caribbean Camera, nice. which is uh, here in, in, in Toronto, which is really great. People can look on my, on my Instagram and see that image there. Uh, with respect to my poster and everything like that, I'm I'm priming up for next year, and it's going to be focusing on uh, futurism, Afrofuturism. You know, given that we're coming out of, the, out of the pandemic, I think it's really important that we focus on certain issues in the future, such as uh, food insecurity, uh, home ownership. So I'm getting people on the poster that are going to represent that. Uh, the other thing I'm working on is an app, which is going to take place. Uh, more aligned towards tr- uh, trivia on Black history, so I'm lining that nice. up for next February, and that's something that I got my students that were working for me for the summer to work on. And uh, what else? Yeah. NFT, NFT. Yeah, well, that's something that I'm going to be working on, so I have to, I have to really be re- researching that. You know, yeah. so that's my own retirement savings plan. There you go. <laughs> there just you case, go. Just in case this poster thing don't work out, right? <laughs> Well, I, we think it's been working quite well, and I, I think the best is still yet to come in regards to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, and next year will be my twenty eighth year doing this. Wow. You know? Yeah, and 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 it's funny because I think about like the amount of things that have been happening in the black community that have been going on for twenty eight years, and it's really a small, small, like small, a real, small, right? Very no, the uh, like AXA is the only thing I know that's been going on, and for that long or there's some other organizations but you are in rare air my brother rare yeah, air yeah. you know so i always have this, these images of myself being so now going 50 years doing this poser is actually in play right oh yeah oh you yeah know? that's just gonna happen if it isn't yeah, you yeah. it's gonna be through you no no that's a done deal that's a done deal it's gonna go i'm thinking yeah. 100 years not 50 years man yeah there's a part of me that's wondering if that would be Honorable to do or pathetic, <laughs> you know. But I, and it's, and I just say that because, like, you know, like I always feel, I, I just, I, I say that jokingly because I know it will be honorable, especially doing it for fifty years. Because I have kids coming up to me who are like twenty years. And I shouldn't say kids, but they're like twenty, twenty-five years old, and they come up to me saying that, "Hey, Mr. Small, my my mother or my grandmother used to get your poster every year." And tell us who was on the poster each year to tell talk to us. Wow. 
history. You know, I've had like seven year olds like grabbing my leg and hugging it and stuff like that. So right. it's been a really, really inspiring ride doing this poster. So nice. there's no reason for me to, to stop doing it at all. And when I have my own daughter, like, you know, pondering the days when she it hit, keeps on doing it, nice. like that's inspiring too. Do you think that you could stop doing something and your, your daughter or son or whichever continues it uh, long afterwards? And, re- and then it really becomes a legacy because somebody else took it on, right? So nice. Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you for all you have done, are doing, and of course will be doing going mm-hmm. forward. I thank you for being our special guest on Emancipation Day and Florence saying thank you. Community is unity for everyone. Open minds and open hearts. Keep the conversations and actions happening. Ashe. I agreed 100% on that. Exactly. Robert, we will be in touch. Thank you very, very much. It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations 2020. Best Podcast News Award winner 2018, Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. I host the only online show for fathers and dads in the world that is sponsored by Dove Men Care. It's also co-sponsored by Dad Central. And I am the board chair of the Global Food and Drink Initiative, which is a multimedia not-for-profit that showcases Blacks in the diaspora that are doing their thing in food, wine, and travel. I'd like to thank everyone who watched this live watching the replay or listening to it via replay. Also like to say in closing out, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get small to get stronger. Block assumptions and aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. Love, faith, and respect. Remember to give yourself grace. Thank you so much to BIA Media and to everyone out there, never settle. Bye, everybody. This ocean is spread with our bones, fed by our flesh, ripped off our thrones to be thrown to its depths, stripped with whips and our tongues taken out of our chests. Slavery broke our families, stole our lungs from our breath, from the hold of the ships to the chains on our necks. And they deemed us as property, only a check. And these docks and this city, they profited, yes. No, not just the South, not just in the U.S. So these warehouses filled with the fruits of our death as the goods came and went and our bodies were spent and the merchants saw profits go up by percents and the sugar came in and the salt cod was sent. And when they could no longer own us, they shifted to rent. But though we were indentured, they could not prevent. I don't think they imagined the way we'd ascend and that's why our culture's all over the net. We've created from nothing again and again. But a stroke of a pen or a scent of a bill, it can't erase centuries of them taking their fill. Look at Haiti, whose freedom they have punished until for centuries that blood has continued to spill for the slave revolution. They'll never forgive. We've been held to the ground from here to Brazil. And oh God, did we build. We built Citadel Hill left on the rockiest lands that we tended with skill we weren't meant to survive they intended to kill and we're still only here through our faith and our will and still we can't rest still treated as guests and still we are tested street checked and arrested still slave on the farms picking fruit unprotected and the streets named for slave owners still uncorrected you can't look in our face and say we're truly accepted and our ancestors' dreams, unfulfilled and deferred. But we still believe freedom is more than a word and we won't end our struggle on August the 1st and we will not dry up in the sun, we won't burn and there's power in our steps, we're done waiting our turn, but this still isn't freedom, not yet. We have made it this far, but there's further to get while you still cross the street because you think we're a threat and you still send police to kick us out of our tents and we still live in a world where black life is condemned while our modern oppressors come round like their friends and they offer us grants for our pressure to end but we will not be bought and our struggle won't sell because we know we inherit generations of strength. Our great-great-grandmothers cradled their babies and wept while the milk dried up in their breasts and their shoulders were bent, yet they still gave us life. We are here in their debt. 
and what we owe each other can only be felt. And that's why when we pass on the streets, we nod with our heads. And that's why when we're pressed, we will always protest. Just like the moon and the waves are a timeless duet, we are pulled by our history to never relent. But what you don't see is the love we still lend. We can't even say our lives matter without causing offense. And yet, we're not broken and we will not bend. And every concession they tried to reject, freedom never was given. We crawled and we crept. For every inch we've progressed, there is so much still left. But emancipation still comes through the pain and the theft. But this still isn't freedom. Not yet. The destruction of Africville we can't forget, nor the graves where our bodies are buried unmarked, nor our elders' land titles exploited by sharks, not while children still hate that their skin tone is dark, not while children still doubt they could ever be smart, but the hope and dream of the slave still burns in our hearts, and our elders have carried us over this far until everyone's free, we still follow that star just like all of our people who died unremarked, because we are called, as the spiritual said. We're not meant to be here, we are meant to be dead, and so every day of our presence is blessed. And one day we'll be living our life at its best, but there's not one black life that will ever be left until we all stand together, we will not accept, because this still isn't freedom, not yet. We have made it this far. There is further to get.